Good morning, everybody. It is so stinking good to see everybody today. Will you stand up with us? The sun is shining. I just poked my head out the side. Just cause It's dark in here, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's nice out. This morning, I pray that, uh, first of all, welcome to Eagle, but this, but this morning, I, I pray for all of us to experience God's love throughout the course of the service today. So I just, I, I pray that as you came in today, the things that might be keeping you from being 100% here for the next hour and 15 minutes, that those would can, kind of be left aside. And I encourage you, if, if you're not in that state yet, to get there so that you can experience God and his love this morning, okay? We're going to start off with, an, with a, a, a great energetic song to get the blood flowing. But let me pray for us real quick. God, we just, we love you. We pray for this morning's service. Through all the elements that come together, God, you know that they're here for one thing, and that's to worship you, worship you alone. God, we, we celebrate, uh, at the start of it, we celebrate just a wonderful time with you this morning. Jesus, thank you so much. Amen. Your name lifted high, oh God, you have 
Have a seat real quick. Good morning, everybody. Have a seat. Good to see everybody. Well, the last few weeks, we've been talking about living on the redemptive edge. And we talked about that redemptive edge is that place where you find a point of darkness and you push it back with the light of Christ's hope. And I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage someone who's been living on that redemptive edge since 2003 in the country of Bosnia. So let's welcome Petula Myers to the stage, please. Petula, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be back. So Petula, in 2003, she was born and raised in northern Indiana, and she's got quite a story about how God put on her heart the Bosnian people, and uh, she ended up accepting a call with a Christian Missionary Alliance to serve as an international worker, and uh, she calls Sarajevo, Bosnia, her home, a long way from northern Indiana. So, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, and so uh, it's been great. She's a part of the Eagle Church family, so we have a, a member of our own congregation serving several thousand miles away, and we just want to take some time while she's stateside for a bit and uh, have some interaction with her. She's going to be with us here. She's going to be with the kids uh, later on. We're going to have some lunch opportunities for you to engage with her, but while she's around, just to connect with her ministry. And Petch, I thought you could start, um, just reset for us the spiritual climate of Bosnia and kind of how that affects your approach to your work there. So kind of just, you know, what, what's the spiritual climate like? Quite different than what we are here. And, oh, you know, you're 18 plus years there, uh, you know, and how it's affected your approach uh, to what you're doing. Um, it's a really complex thing to explain. Um, suffice it to say that in the early, nine, early to mid-90s, there was an ethnic war, um, which really was more of a, uh, ethnic groups are also divided religious groups. Um, so some of those are from more traditional Christian backgrounds, uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy, and then also we have half of the population who are Muslims. And so um, recently, just in the last couple of years, I've been really thinking about it because it's frustrating. Um, it's a country of 3.5 million people and only 500 Bible-believing Christians after almost 30 years of, of working. Wow. Um, and so, so say that again. You've got 3.5 million people. 500 believers. In the and whole country. 30 years of work, yeah. 30 years of work. Um, so on an average <laughs> Sunday morning, you know, pre-COVID, we would have 500-plus bodies in this auditorium on a Sunday morning, and that would represent the entire Bible-believing followers of Jesus in Bosnia. Yes, um, so I think uh, one of the things that God has really been taking me back to is actually uh, the parable of the sower. Um, and a lot of times when I heard that parable, um, it was sort of told in a way that, hey, we should just accept that we cast a lot of seed and maybe like one quarter of that seed actually takes root. Um, but something that God's brought me back to, because I'm an Indiana girl, and though I didn't, wasn't raised on a farm, I do understand how farming works. Um, is that no farmer throws seed into like just any field and thinks he's going to get a great crop out of that. Um, he looks at the soil that's there before him and he says, what do I do to have to make this soil fertile? And so that's something I feel like God has really been saying to me is that we need to take a look. There are some places where the soil is fertile and ready to plant a seed, mm. but there are other places where there may be a little work that needs to be done or there may be a lot of work at, and even years of work that need to be done to get that soil to a point where it's fertile to take a seed. And so that's something that I think our team is wrestling with and that I personally am just wrestling with that I have to be ready to put in the hard work and maybe mm. my job in Bosnia for the entire time that I'm there um, until I go to meet my maker is going to be preparing the soil. Wow. I'm not going to get to harvest a lot. I'm not going to get to plant mm. a lot, but I'm going to prepare the soil. That's good perspective, Hetchla. So 2020, no doubt, had to be a super challenging year yeah. on your end, <laughs> right, when it comes to the context of ministry in that setting with COVID realities. Maybe talk about the struggles of that and, and how you guys tried to adjust and uh, change the way you were connecting with people? Well, I believe that the church that I'm a part of maybe today has met for the first time in like a year? six or eight months. Wow. We've met once or twice in between, a little bit at the beginning, 
But so in the last year, we've probably met a total of five times in person, even though it's a very small congregation of just maybe 20 or 30 people, um, because we had very strict mask rules. We have to wear masks inside and out, um, no more than 15 to thir sometimes thir it was as low as only 15 people in a room at one time, and they all have to be six feet apart and with masks on. Wow. Um, and so, and we have a very small space, so to get 15 people six feet apart is nearly impossible in our space. You could ask Justin and Ryan, they've been in that space, so they can imagine what that's like. Um, and we aren't equipped to do online services, we aren't equipped to do live stream, and so hmm. churches have just really been challenged by that. Some of them have tried to keep their doors open, and then like the pastor and the whole worship team gets COVID, hmm. and then you have to shut everything down. And so hmm. um, it's just been a real battle, um, but the the upside is that we uh, pre-record services like worship and and messages. And one of the things we've noticed is that we are having a lot more hits mm. on our YouTube channel uh, than we've ever had before. And we've had inquiries. So the downside is that we haven't been able to be together. But the upside of that has been that we do see people that maybe wouldn't have come through the doors of the church are watching us, even though nobody knows about that. So we're hoping to see fruit from that yeah. one day. Yeah. Um, and so we can remember the year of COVID uh, <laughs> that, that brought us fruit yeah. many years down the road. So, so maybe a story of just where you've seen God moving just over the past year in the midst of the struggles? Um, I think definitely what I already shared about this, that we are having some people watching on YouTube and inquiring. Um, some of my really close friends who are believers and leaders of churches have friends and family members that they shared the gospel with 20 years ago and were completely uninterested. And when they called to check up on them uh, during the time of COVID, mm. they suddenly really were spiritually interested. And so we see that happening in different lives, but also just in the church as a whole, I think that we've become a lot better at taking care of one another, like calling to check on people, really, mm. if we haven't heard from them in a while, making sure they're okay. And so that is one of the great things that I see coming out of even our small mm -hmm. uh, group of believers is that they really have become much more concerned. We've become much more closer emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think spiritually, a lot of us have become a lot closer to the Lord, um, even though physically we're being asked to distance ourselves. Talk about a couple of ways if people want to connect with you, some like tangible ways people could be more connected with you and support what you're doing. Uh, well, prayer is definitely the number one thing that I will always ask uh, for people. And of course, I can never thank Eagle enough for the amazing way that they, they financially support me and our ministry in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and so that's such an important thing. You can definitely always give and you can talk to me more about that. We have a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, but also, um, we take interns. So if anyone's interested uh, in coming over as an intern, you can come for a month or a year or two years. Um, we're hoping maybe that we'll get a team sometime in the next six months to a year to come over um, and partner in that way. But that's those are definitely ways that you can partner with us and be a part of the work that God is doing. And we're even looking now at new ways that possibly our partner churches can be a part of our regular programs in the center via Zoom because everyone okay. now, we're all Zoom meeting experts. And so uh, maybe doing some seminars and workshops via Zoom and we'll just facilitate those. So we're hoping that that will be a possibility in the future. So one of the ways that Petula is resourced is all of your gifts. So we take 11% of every dollar that's given at Eagle and we give it towards missions. And a chunk of that money goes to what's called the Christian Missionary Alliance's Great Commission Fund. And Petula is, that's her salary and benefits and everything comes out of the Great Commission Fund. There's about 700 workers serving in 81 nations around the world with the Alliance, of which Petula is one of those. And so you, through your gifts, have an effect in 81 nations, and you're getting a report directly uh, from Bosnia this morning and 18 plus years with Petula being there. So it's a great conduit for us. And maybe to wrap things up, Petula, just give us a couple of very specific ways um, as we pray for you and pray for Bosnia. Give us some insight on, on how to pray uh, so we can pray really poignantly, kind of that redemptive edge, you know, that point of darkness and push it back with the light of Christ. Yeah. Um, well, 
we've been in, the Alliance has been in Bosnia-Herzegovina now for about 22 or 23 years. Mm. Um, and right before COVID, we had what we call a strategic review, which is something we do every five years. Um, and not long after that, I became the team leader, <laughs> which is something I've never done before. But one of the things we're doing, and I think a lot of churches, even stateside, are doing this, is we're just sort of, we've torn everything down to bare bones, and we're reevaluating the way that we do everything in ministry, and asking ourselves, what ways do we have to change that because of COVID? Because the reality in Bosnia-Herzegovina is, I mean, COVID could last till 2020. 2023, 2024, wow. 2025, it may never go away. Yeah. Um, and we are on serious lockdown still. Mm. Um, and so just looking at that and reevaluating it. So I think um, just praying for us, praying for me. This week I get to finish the budget uh, for our team for the next year. So figuring out those kinds of things when you just don't know what's going to happen can yeah. be really hard. Um, and there's some changes too with the financial system in the alliance, which is a new change for a lot of us. And so just praying for that, that that all of us are, work together well as a team, yeah. that we really know, we see what God is calling us to do, and just understand how we're supposed to continue to partner with the local Bosnian church there, um, but to also still, you know, push forward um, as far as sharing the gospel and reaching people for Christ. That's good. So church, let's make a commitment, right? Is this kind of top of mind from this morning? Maybe just put a little note for, hey, when you're gathering for meals or definitely over lunch today, let's just make sure we pause and we pray you know, for Petula, for Bosnia, for the work to go forward. Um, obviously, the environment that she's in, apart from God moving, um, you know, it's just such difficult. It's pushing a rock up the hill. It's really, really tough sledding there. Several of you have spent time with Petula on the soil in Bosnia pre-COVID when we used to send teams over there and spend time with her, and you kind of carry that, you know, that front row seat um, to the environment that she's working in. So, opportunities to connect with her. You're going to be downstairs this morning, right? With the kiddos. Yes, and I'm then going to be down there. after service, there's a group, there's a small group having lunch with you, I think from elders and staff. And then next Sunday, it's an open invite lunch to the first 20 people who sign up. So pull out your phones if you want to sign up. Eaglechurch.com slash events. After service next Sunday, we'll give you a free lunch and Petula is going to be there. And she's just going to talk a little more in depth about some of the stuff we're talking about here, an opportunity for you to build a bridge of relationship and get a little more connected. So that's next Sunday after service, eaglechurch.com slash events is where you sign up. And we have to cap it at 20 just so we've got enough room for everybody to spread out and eat. Right. And I'm totally willing. I do have a lot of work to do this week, but if you don't get it into the 20, but you still would like to meet up with me for coffee or anything like that, feel free to contact the office at Eagle, let them know, and then they can forward your contact information to me and I can get a hold of you and we can meet up in person or we can talk over the phone yeah, or do right. a Zoom or whatever you're comfortable with. So, And maybe after the service, after you're done with the kiddos, can you hang out at the kiosk area yeah, out I'll there? I'll be out there. So out there Afterwards, if you want to meet her and hang out with her there, I uh, appreciate that. All right. Let's pray together, pray a blessing over her as we head back into worship. Jesus, thank you so much for Petula. Thank you for her faithfulness. Thank you for this report uh, about certainly a, a different kind of soil that she's working in. We just pray your blessings over her. You'll fill her with your spirit, that you'll give her strength and energy and perseverance. We pray for a harvest to come one day. Uh, Lord, we pray that there would be many, many Bosnians come to Jesus. We pray for disciples to be raised up, for leaders and churches to grow and flourish. We pray that the light of Christ would push back uh, the front of darkness there that seems to be so steeply entrenched. And we pray that her time here with us and her time stateside and the, that these times together would be a blessing to her, that you'll equip Petula with everything she needs to lead in the ways you're calling her to lead now. And we just ask you to fill her and bless her and watch over her and strengthen her. We thank you for the gift that she is to us and to the work of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Another round of applause for Petula. And thank you. Why don't you stand back up with us? We'll keep, keep worship, worshiping.
waiting for change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your
still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. So the waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still my soul the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord when disappointment grief and fear are gone sorrow for God love's pure joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past. All safe and blessed we shall Psalm 77, verse 13 and following. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhe. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Let's pray. God, your ways, O oh, oh Lord, are holy. You're great, you're awesome, you're majestic. Thank you for being the God who makes a way when there seems to be no way. And as we turn our hearts to your word now, we pray that you would open us. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and wills to obey. We love you, we worship you, we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, our guest speaker this morning is Pastor Kurt Sovine. And Kurt and I go back 20 plus years together in friendship and a colleague in ministry. Uh, Kurt and his wife, Kimberly, and their two beautiful daughters. There's a picture of their family. I think we've got a family pick up here. So many of you have gotten to know the Sovines recently, especially their girls, Alyssa and Ansley, who have been connected more and more in student world around here. And 
Um, so Kurt and Kimberly most recently planted a church called Connection Church in Danville, Illinois, and uh, he became lead pastor there and served there, and their family's been rooted in Danville for many years. And then this past summer, they sensed a call from God to join the Midwest District Office staff. He's now our Director of Multiplication here. So they relocated from Danville to Zionsville. They just moved into a home in Clark Meadows here across the way. And uh, so, Kurt, I mean, our friendship's just been such a meaningful part of my journey. We pick up the phone and call each other, encourage each other, pray for each other, hang out at district conference together, serve on different committees together, share a lot of history together. And, and over the years, uh, here's a few things I've gotten to know about Kurt. Number one, uh, this man loves Christ with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, number two, he loves Jesus' church and Jesus' mission in this world. Number three, he loves his family deeply. And number four, something new I learned this past year, he had a really strategic like COVID self-quarantine plan. So here was Kurt Sovine's COVID self-quarantine plan. He wanted to get dropped off in the middle of the woods in southern Georgia with all of his hunting gear and just told everyone, just leave him there and come out. He'll come out when all this is passed because that's how much he loves to hunt and fish and do all that, whole, all that stuff, right? So let's put our hands together and welcome to the stage Pastor Kurt Sovine. Thanks, Eric. So the hunting thing is sort of serious. And if whoever's cheering, I want to talk to you. Because I left a lot of good hunting ground in Illinois. Had a conversation with Eric before we made the transition over here. And I was sitting in my car in the parking lot of our church. And uh, it was really cool just to see how the Lord answered some big questions for me. And I don't cry often, but I started to shed tears after I talked to Eric on the phone. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to open God's word with you this morning. Going to invite us just to pray again. Uh, Lord Jesus, what a privilege to be with you, with your people in your place, about your kingdom and your work. Father, would you quiet not just the atmosphere of this room, but the stirring in our hearts and our minds of all that is going on around us, all that we brought with us, that we might hear you and know you. We pray this, Jesus, for your glory in your name. Amen. Appreciate Psalm 77 that Eric read for us. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. It's the crossing of the Red Sea. God was leading his people on his mission to the place that he wanted to give them. But the path that he was leading them on led them through the mighty waters. At that point, some of us are like, you know what, God, I actually have my own plan for my life. I have my own pathway that I want to walk. It's a bit different, Lord, than the path that you want me on, but I've kind of designed this for me. It's a pathway that I control. I'm going to ask you from time to time, Lord, to sprinkle a little bit of favor and a little bit of your power and your goodness on my pathway, but for the most part, will you just kind of leave me alone? It'll be a life where even though we might settle a bit, where we might find ourselves enslaved a bit, it will be a life that will ultimately be about me. When Eric started this sermon series at the beginning of the year, he said something that is actually incredibly shocking. And contrary to everything that the world around us pushes in on our lives, we are not the main character of the story. Now, nobody actually fell out of their chair. I was here, but the idea is completely foreign to the world that we live in. What do you mean I'm not the main character of the story? Well, God is. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean that there is a creator God and out of his genius and power all things were created and by his control all things hold together? 
And by his might, all of human history moves where he is leading it. Where does that leave us? Where does that leave you? Where does that leave me? If it is true that there is the one true living God of the Bible, and that he alone is God, then I can't possibly be in charge of my own life. Because he is. Now, in order to get around this reality, people... Sometimes people in the church work pretty hard to try to eliminate God as much as they possibly can. Now, in case you didn't know this, we can't actually eliminate God. But people try. We try to strip him of his power. We try to argue against the Bible. We find reasons to point our finger at the church. And we blame the church for something. The church, by the way, is us, but we point our finger at the church to try to push the church aside, to try to push Christians aside so that we can try to push God aside, all in an effort to remain the kings and queens of our own deal so that we control the narrative, so that we control the objectives, we define the wins. And if we can eliminate any sense of the presence of God in our lives, then we can mostly live like the main character of the story is me. Along comes the enemy, Satan, who wants to convince us that somehow this path that we define is the win. That this is actually the path that we want to walk. The autonomous path designed by me and for me. Or, or we kind of love that up a little bit and we make it the path designed by me, for me and my family. For me and those that I like. For me and those who are like me. We've become contented people trapped in places of enslavement. Far from God. Thinking that this is the best shot we have at a good life. And so we stay put. And we strive to refuse anything that would come along and disrupt. Or jeopardize our semi-comfortable existence. Pastor Eric asked me if I would preach in our series on the crossing of the Red Sea. It's probably a familiar story to most of you. God has called his people to leave Egypt. And if you go back and read all of the context of this story, usually when you see Egypt in this context, you're going to see the words, the land of slavery. The writer reminds us of that over and over, the place where the Israelites were slave labor for Pharaoh. But at least they had food to eat. And they had the Egyptian army protecting them. And they were sheltered underneath the most powerful nation in the world. And they had a very predictable life to live. Stuck in slavery to the whims and the desires of an evil man. But at least they were fairly comfortable. Exodus 13 is where we start this morning in God's word. Verse 17 when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. If it gets tough, I know those people, they're probably going to look backward and want to go back into the land of slavery. So God, because he loved them, right? Do you see that? Not because he wants to hurt them, because he loves them, leads them a different way. They're going to the Red Sea. And so the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Jumping down to verse 21. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God knew the hearts of these men and women. He knew that if the path that he laid out for them led them into trouble, they're going to long to go back into their lives in Egypt. I'm going to ask the guys to throw up a quick graphic for us just to give you a, a picture of the geography of where we're at in the world. Don't get too caught up on all the rest of the noise on this screen. I just want you to see where we are and recognize that to the north, 
the way of the Philistines up there, there were some east-west trade routes that would have been fairly well-worn roads that would have been easy to walk on or ride on. But they would have had all sorts of armed garrisons along the way and all sorts of checkpoint type situations where the Israelites would have a tough go. So God said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to go a different way. We're going to go a way that nobody's anticipating. We're going to avoid all of that and head down toward the Red Sea. And I'm going to invite the Israelites to go down there simply with the promise of my presence with them. So the people come to the Red Sea. The mighty Egyptian army is trailing them. Pharaoh is upset with the decision that he made to release the Israelites. Eric told us a week or two ago, we got about a million people in this journey currently standing on dry ground, right? This ground looks like the kind of place I want to stand. They're facing the Red Sea in front of them that they can't swim across. They've got the most powerful army in the world breathing down their necks. And we come to 14 verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us up out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Story reminds me of a young man that I walked with for about 20 years. He spent the majority of that time incarcerated in various places. After spending about nine years locked up in a prison facility somewhere in the central part of Illinois, because they don't put these folks near home, I drove over to pick him up. We're riding home, we're in the cornfields on the interstate, and he starts to get all fidgety on me. I'm like Eric, I'm a well-built guy, I could take care of myself if I have to, but he was a little bit bigger than me. Before long, Jeff is laying in the back seat of my car. So what are you doing? Kurt, for nine years, I haven't seen anything move faster than somebody walking or running. And all of the traffic on the interstate was like messing with his head. Says, all right, we're gonna we're gonna <clears throat> try to grab some lunch. Let's pull in this subway in the middle of the cornfields, grab some lunch. Jeff, you gotta come in and order. No, Kurt, order for me. I don't want to go in there. Hey, they got a lot of choices. You gotta come inside and order, because I don't know what to order for you. So he comes inside and we're standing in line in the middle of nowhere, right? He's, he doesn't know anybody, I don't know anybody. The whole time he's doing this. And it started to dawn on me. I'm asking Jeff to live in the free world when all he knows is how to be confined, trapped. So we get up to the counter. I never knew ordering at Subway could be so hard. He was overwhelmed with the choices in front of him. For over nine years, Jeff had never had to make a choice, let alone 30 choices about his sandwich. And I didn't realize that I was inviting him out of his world that even though he was enslaved, if you will, confined, he was comfortable. And I was saying, hey, dude, there's a great place out here in the free world. You can come. You could go to Subway. I like Subway a little bit. But you go there, and I'm like, my sandwich is this big when I'm done because I order a bunch of stuff. Jeff, it'll be awesome. You'll love it. Kurt, I just, I like go back. I want to go back to that place where I was comfortable. I had my routine. I had three meals a day. I had a bed to sleep in. I never had to worry about that. He didn't know how to be free. He didn't know how to live in the world that God had actually created him to live in. It makes me think of the Israelites leaving Egypt. They were designed for so much more than just making bricks for an evil man. So here they are, and I ask the question, what are the Israelites, a million of them, doing on dry ground, staring at the Red Sea? How did they get here? And they're asking, weren't we at least okay in Egypt? Well, friends, you're here because God brought you here. You're here because the one who made you for himself told you, I've got a different life for you to live. Not a life of slavery, but a life in the promised land. A with God life, a life with me, 
on mission with me. A life for the people of Israel will become God's treasured possessions. As we go through the Old Testament, you're going to see these words over and over. God was calling them and said, of all the nations on the planet, I've seen them all. I'm calling you out to be my treasured possession. They will be the ones who will experience blessing from God. If you're familiar with the covenants of the Old Testament, Israelites are going to receive Abrahamic blessings right here, right now. They will be the ones who will have the place, the temple, where God will dwell among his people. They will be the ones from whom will come the one who will crush the head of the serpent from Genesis 3, who will bring the blessing to all nations from the promise to Abraham, who will sit on the throne of David forever that was promised to King David. God has so much more for his people than simply eking out a mildly comfortable existence. But the path is going to be through the mighty waters. Dear friends, we're pretty comfortable people. Pretty comfortable over there in Clark Meadows. It's a nice neighborhood. It's quiet. I got everything I need. And the Lord says, hey, I'm calling you into a place that I have designed you for. The path may not be the easiest, But I'm calling you into deeper intimacy and experience of power and the eternal pleasures of relationship with God. But they had to leave Egypt in order to pursue this life that they were created for. They had to leave Egypt on the back of the Passover lamb. God was going to provide the way. But the people in their humanity, maybe like us, are scared, timid. They're worried about their comfort. They were consumers of life demanding that their simple desires be met. This journey, this facing off with the Egyptian army, this facing the Red Sea, it all disrupted their routine, their pattern, their shallow comfort. And so Moses stands up in front of them, and he's quite the leader at this point. He answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see Again, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Eagle Church, my family is new here, but we are not new to your story. Matter of fact, I have been a part of following your story since the day you began. This is not the first time that God has called you to cross the Red Sea. This is not the first time that God has looked at you as a people and said, hey, we're coming out of where you've been and we're going to where I'm leading you. I'm not new to our Alliance family. I assure you this is not the first time that God is calling our Alliance family to leave something behind and head off with him into the place we were designed to be. This is not the first time my family has had the one who calls us to leave out of the places of comfort and even slavery to chase off into the life that he has designed for us. Now, I want to assure you, sometimes his call on our lives is to leave something that is not necessarily sinful or evil. It may be even something that we would call good. He called my family to leave 22 years of relationship with people we deeply love. To leave a place where our comfort level was off the charts. To leave a familiar place with a familiar routine. He calls us to leave and follow him. Is that easy? No. Ever? Not yet. Not for me. Is it comfortable? No. Do you get all the answers? Let's go back and listen to several of the last few weeks that Eric has preached. Does God do it all the way you want him to do it? I think I need to ask that one again. Does God do it all the way you want him to do it? Because God, if I'm going to go, here's the deal. It's got to be this, 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 and this. It wasn't this, 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 or this. Is the journey hard and scary and full of massive obstacles? Sure it is. 
Israel didn't fully know what they were walking into in the promised land. All they could do was trust the one who called them to leave Egypt and promise them, I'll be with you. And just so you know I'm with you, there's going to be a big cloud and a big pillar of fire, and you're going to see those everywhere you go. And you'll know I'm present. Trust and follow. Friends, some Christians try to do this out of a religious or moralistic motivation. It looks kind of like this. I will do what God says so that I can get from God what I want to get from God. If that's you, then I'm pretty sure that leaving Egypt and crossing the Red Sea in your life is not going to make a lick of sense. You won't see the value in it. You won't go because we obey to get things from God. Others, hopefully us in this room and us who are listening online, obey and follow God to get him. Why are we leaving Egypt? Because I'm on the with God thing. And God said to go and there's God's presence and I'm with him. So here we go. We follow him so that we're with him. Wherever we're called, whatever we're called to do, his presence is the point throughout the story. Now, the people argue, but we seemed okay in Egypt. We could have stayed there. Why didn't you just leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? And if you and I are the center of the story, and it's all about us, then that's a really good question. If life is all about what I want and what I think and what I plan, then it seems really crazy that here I am standing with a powerful Egyptian army on one side and the Red Sea on the other side. Help me understand this, Moses. What are we doing out here? What on earth is going on? Now, I quietly wonder if any of the people ever stopped to say, what's on the other side of the Red Sea? Because if they had pressed that question a little bit more, they might have been a little bit more excited to head over there. Moses answers them, y'all need to see the Lord. You need to see his power. You need to know what it is to come be still in his presence and know that he is God. And God is saying throughout the story, I brought you out here to show you something I couldn't show you in Egypt. And I love this. I hang on this truth all the time. I needed to bring you here to show you some things I couldn't show you when you were over there. I need to show you myself and my power. So the question is, will the people follow? Remember Moriah, where Abraham had to offer up his only son Isaac on the altar. God was checking his heart. As Eric said, when so much becomes too much, it's up, Moriah, you go. Here God is checking the heart of the entire nation as a collective people. The west side of the Red Sea represented the life the people chose. The east side was where God chose for the people to go. The west side of the Red Sea is where the people live for themselves. The east side is where the people will be God's people in God's promised land with God's presence, being witnesses of God's to the nation and bringing about the people of God out of whom will come the Savior of God to defeat the enemy of God for the glory of God. How on earth can we be people who say, no, I just want to go back to slavery when we have invitations like this? And if God can get the people across, and if God can deal with the Egyptian army that is following them, then God beyond a shadow of a doubt proves that the story is all about him. And we should follow. Sometime when you're bored, I invite you to Google the Red Sea story. And you will see numerous articles that you can read trying to explain the Red Sea crossing in scientific terms. Why? Uh, Maybe it was the Reed Sea and not the Red Sea. Turns out we're not really sure what the Reed Sea is or where it is. But it might have been easier to cross. Maybe it was a strong wind that caused the water to pile up on one side. Except the passage says the water piled up on both sides. 
Maybe there was a drought and it was really shallow at this time and they could just walk across. Maybe it's just a metaphor and it didn't actually even happen. I'm fascinated by how hard people try to explain away the existence of God and the miraculous power of God. Now, those articles make no sense when you read on in the passage and you realize that God used the waters piled up as a means of destroying the entire Egyptian army so that not one of them survived. I don't think that happened in six inches of water. I don't think that happened at a narrow crossing, right? Because all I got to do is watch two or three chariots to go in there and get wiped out before I'm like, whoa, I don't think I'm coming in there. No, 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 no. It's a massive place in the middle of the sea. And the army all goes in there collectively and they all get wiped out collectively. But if I'm going to maintain that I'm the center of the story and God of my own life, then I have to explain away the existence and power and presence of the one true living God of the Bible. And Satan wins. Because at best, I'll make a mediocre mess of my life. The life that he gave me to live. God, who designed me for himself. I will strive for some comfort in the midst of my flesh's slavery to the consumerism of this world. I will spend my days chasing pleasure and avoiding pain. And all the while, the one who created me for himself will be inviting me to cease striving Psalm 46, 10. Many of you know that as be still. Cease striving and know that he's God. That the God who designed you, who loves you, who created you for his good and pleasing purposes, calls you to come to himself so that you can enjoy his presence and chill out a bit on all the scrambling and frantic activity that we get into trying to shape this life. I needed to hear those words from the Lord. Cease striving and know that I'm God. And let me be Lord of your life. And let me help you to live the life that I designed you to live. We're going to have to cross the sea to get there. I want to share a quote with you in a minute. I I imagine Eric has already shared this quote with you. Eric's like this walking catalog of all the best quotes on the planet, isn't he? He's also an incredible storyteller. That part I've known for 20 years. What I didn't realize is Eric is an incredible creator of stories, meaning his life just seems to spin these things out. Like who actually can come up with a sermon illustration after they hang a light over the kitchen table? (laughs) I need to have a little moment with Eric. Eric, it's called an owner's manual. It walks you through the instructions. It tells you where all the parts go. (laughs) C.S. Lewis. He said, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition. When infinite joy is offered us, Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And today we learn that a holiday at the sea, it comes with some challenges, some risk, some sacrifice, some stepping out and then being still. But do you know that God often does his best work when you and I are not comfortable? When we are not satisfied with mud pies, when the American dream is not that valued in our hearts and minds, when safety and security, when health and happiness are not the ultimate aim of our lives, but instead it is to know the one who dwelt in the cloud, who showed up in the pillar of fire. Then the Lord said to Moses in verse 15, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. It's time to go. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. 
The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, this is one of the most incredible scenes in scripture, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Eagle Mount Moriah was about the heart of one man as an individual getting things right with the Lord. The Red Sea is about a people together, leading, leaving the place of comfort and heading off together to follow our God into the promised land, into the place where he will be our God and we will be his people and he will dwell among us. Eagle, we're leaving Egypt. We're leaving Egypt. What's on the other side of the Red Sea? I don't know. But I know the one who is leading us across and whose footprints we may not see, but whose presence we know. And I know that we get to go together. And I hope that matters to you. It's time for us to refuse the daily grind of life for ourselves, where we gather up moments of pleasure while we wait to die, and instead we chase after the one who has invited us into life with him for his glory. At times terrifying at times confusing, at times cloudy and dark and dreary, at times lonely and even painful. And I appreciate the transparency of our pastor. He shared all of those things with us in the weeks preceding this. At times it's all of that. But you know what? All those things were true in Egypt as well, right? All that was already there. The invitation of our God is to say, hey, come here. Come follow me. Live in my presence. Go where I go and do what I do. So what's stopping us from saying yes to the Lord? From crossing over to where we are designed to go, where we are created to be. From fully committing our paths to Christ. From laying down our lives for him. From saying yes to the invitations of our king. To spend our time and our money and our energy on things that build his kingdom and not our own. Does Satan have you convinced that life in Egypt is better than life with Jesus? Filling your minds with ways to push God into the dark corners. Now, full transparency. If you haven't read on in the Bible, you may not know that when the Israelites actually get to the promised land, they're going to find that it's full of people and idols and wilderness, and battles, and enemies, and war, and all sorts of other things that will make the reality of daily dependence on God their daily truth. But they're also going to find that they're smack in the middle of what God called them to do, what God created them to be, and the work that God created them to engage in. So let's wrap this up, verse 31. And when the Israelites, this is after they've crossed over, the Egyptian army followed and got wiped out, in its entirety. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. I love it. They come out on the other side. Their enemy is gone and they get the prize. The presence of the Father, Yahweh, Emmanuel, God with us forever. The with God life. Simple question, are you in? Are you ready to cross the sea even if you can't see God's exact footprints? Ready to go with him wherever that leads? I've never been a part of a church where I wasn't somehow either a kid or in a leadership role and it's been interesting to sit and observe and watch and all of that. And I'm a, a person who likes to think through things as I sit there. And I want to share this, a new guy, right? I'm a new guy to the table, to the, to the family. I believe exciting things are coming for Eagle Church. I believe God is stirring things in the hearts and minds of his people. I believe there is a, a diehard remnant of God's people that COVID has done some sifting on. 
But there's a remnant of God's people who are eager to say, if he's going across the sea, we're going across the sea. I don't know what that looks like. But we get the opportunity to fear the Lord and trust him. And here, God put Moses in the place of leading the people across. Eric, I appreciate your leadership. Eagle family, I look forward to walking together as we cross the sea, as we go where the Lord leads us, and he turns this place loose in incredible kingdom ways to influence the ends of the earth and to influence Clark Meadows and all the places where you live. Are you in? Lord Jesus, we want to hear your voice calling us out of whatever our Egypt might look like, whether it's truly a place of enslavement or it's just a place that we became comfortable in and a place that you said, your time there is finished. It's time to move on. It's time to do something else that I have prepared for you to do. We want to hear your voice. We want to see your mighty hand work so we can stare into your face and realize that the one who calls us is faithful and you will do it. Father, would you show us as a church family what it is to cross the Red Sea? What it is to head into the promised land where you will be our God and we will be your people and you will dwell among us. Help us to see where Satan trips us up, where he's lying to us, where he's trying to convince us that we don't want to go, that we'd be better off staying in the place where we're making bricks. And that by your power and your might, by your invitation, may we count it a privilege to know that our God is the one whose path often leads through the mighty waters. And though we can't see your footprints, Oh, we know your presence. We kind of privileged to go with you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We're ready to go. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you so much, Kirk, for being faithful to the word the Lord gave you. Thanks also for encouraging Eric as a leader and a storyteller and calling him out for his handyman skills or lack thereof. But for real, thank you, Kurt, so much. We invite you to stand, and at this time, as we close with Amen. one more song, we're also going to take our tithes this is for and offerings. You. Again, as one of the pastors here, we are so grateful for your sacrificial giving. There's instructions on the screen for how you can give online, text to give. If you're here in this room, you can also drop it in the black boxes in the back of the room. But again, thank you, because the things that the people here on the platform get to do throughout the week, the people who are serving downstairs and upstairs and everywhere, it is a byproduct of your generosity. So thank you. And now we're going to join our voices in worship once more. Here we go. And I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied and here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. 
to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Yeah. Come on. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn gone into dancing You took beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can you're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Come on No, there's nothing highways you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the You're the only one who can. Team, good job. Have a seat for a moment. Going to draw your attention to a few items. Can we put our hands together and thank Kurt Sovine for his word this morning? Brother, thank you. Thanks for your friendship through the years. Great challenge to us as a body today for sure. If you're new with us this morning, uh, I've got a gift, uh, gift bag for you at Guest Central area. There's a person there to help answer questions for you online. If you're joining us new, your online host can direct you accordingly. And uh, we've got, we're looking forward to some weeks coming up as we head towards Easter. Just want to draw your attention to change of schedule for Easter weekend. We'll have two services, 9 and 11. And uh, we discussed this last week, but we're going to do a, a, a sh uh, kind of a reduced children's ministry at 9 o'clock. 
So we're going to do pre-K, kind of the infants, toddlers, preschoolers, 9 o'clock, and then a full-blown children's ministry at 11. So if you can help us out, for those of you who don't have maybe children's ministry needs, the age and stage of life you're at, if you can prioritize 9 o'clock, free up seats at 11. We're trying to create two services, spread folks out, that kind of deal, for Easter weekend. And we can use your help in kids' ministry world. So we need another 20 to 25 hands uh, to help out Kim and her staff. So uh, these would just be kind of a one-time opportunity on Easter weekend and then the Sunday following both at 9 and 11. If you could jump in and help out, if you could just send a brief note to info at eaglechurch.com. Even if you haven't been super connected in Kids World, if you could jump in. We're going to do two services both weekends, identical, so you'll be able to worship one, serve one. If you could just help out with that, that would be greatly appreciated as we're hoping to have a lot of guests come during those weeks. So Easter weekend and then the uh, Sunday following, we're going to have head coach from the Colts, Coach Frank Reich will be here sharing at both 9 and 11. If you've never met Coach Reich in a church capacity before, you're very familiar with him on the sidelines, but his life before the sidelines was in a pulpit. He was a pastor uh, for a couple of years. He was president of a seminary. Uh, He loves the Lord with all of his heart. Crazy smart guy, Um, just a great friend, and he is going to preach the message on the 11th. So our desire is Easter Sunday. We'll invite a bunch of folks to come back the following week to listen to Coach Reich and for him to continue to open up God's Word for that. So maybe you've got some friends, family, maybe those who haven't been super connected in church world, Easter weekend, Coach Reich weekend, both great opportunities for you to use uh, bridges for that. Again, 9 and 11, both of those weekends, so plan accordingly for us. We would appreciate that. All right, let's stand together and send you out with a benediction this morning. Don't forget, if you want to be a part of lunch with Petula next Sunday, sign up for that, and she'll be hanging out there in the uh, kiosk area. And maybe, Kurt, if you wouldn't mind like hanging out down here, folks want to interact with you, Kurt. Uh, Kurt will be down here if you want to say some words to he and his family and welcome them officially to the Eagle community. We're grateful for the Sovines of being a part of the Eagle family. All right, Psalm 90, I thought of the prayer of Moses as Kurt was preaching. I was thinking, you know, I wonder if Moses had this story in mind when he wrote the only psalm, the only prayer of Moses that we we believe we have in our hands is Psalm 90. And there's a line in here, verse 12, Moses said, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I wonder if he circled folks up on the other side of the Red Sea for that conversation. So may the God of Moses and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, may he bless you as a people today, let's call it the rightly numbering people, that you might go forth today and whatever sea you're staring at, that God might turn it into a highway and you'd cross it rightly ordering your days and seeing time from his perspective. Go with his blessing. Amen.